Welcome to Mental Health Monday. I'm Jerry Walker and I'm a licensed professional counselor and I have my special and very good friend and doctor, Dr. Lisa Doctor, with us tonight and I know a lot of times we think of medical doctors as going to them for physical reasons but Dr. Lisa has a different approach through her practice. And also, I'm going to make a little disclaimer here right now to say that she's not here to give medical advice tonight, but instead, we're going to talk about and she's going to help us understand the relationship between shame and how that becomes a barrier to our pursuit for self-care. Welcome, Lisa. So glad you're with us tonight. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, thank you for that great introduction. And I am going to talk a little bit more about that. So my name is Lisa Doctor. That's Dr. Doctor. And I do really enjoy uh, my title there. It's a lot of fun. <clears throat> um, we won't start singing just yet, but we were talking about it. So I practice a type of medicine called mind-body uh, spirit medicine. and. The basic idea behind mind, body, spirit medicine is that our feelings, our stressors, and our physical health cannot be separated. They overlap and influence each other in a, in a bi-directional manner. And this merging of these ideas in Western medicine started about 50 years ago when this cardiologist at Harvard began to see the effects of stress on his heart patients and began looking to Eastern medicine for some answers to help his cardiac patients work through stress differently and its impact on heart disease. Now, I promise today I'm going to highlight a little bit of the science behind mind-body-spirit medicine. I don't want to bore anybody to death. But I think it's important to talk about a few points and then, and then again, as Jerry pointed out, thank you for that introduction, that we're really going to talk about barriers to self-care. I am a medical doctor. Um, people do come in and a lot of times doctors end up saying, well, we want you to do this and we want you to do that. And most people want to make changes for their health. They want to make changes in their exercise and their nutrition and their smoking and you know any number of things and we'll talk about that some more. <clears throat> but sometimes this to-do list of all these things that we need to do for self-care actually becomes another chronic stressor. And that's kind of where that shame piece comes in. So, I am going to go ahead and put some notes on the board. It helps me stay focused. Again, I promise this is not intended to be a big detailed lecture of science, but it really does help me stay focused. And I'll try to make my writing better. <laughs> yeah, we know about doctor's writings. Yeah, we know about doctor's writings. So, so the first thing right off the bat, why I'm, why I'm just getting started here, is I, I like to tell stories, that's still part of who I am. And I began to think about stories. There's not a lot of funny stories about shame and expectations, but I actually did think of one. I'm also a mother. So I kind of lived this myself too. And so a few years ago, my kid was 10, and she came back from a church camp. It wasn't a Cathedral of the Rockies church camp, but she came back from church camp, and she had a terrible time. Like, how can you have a bad time at camp? <laughs> And we sat and we listened to her story and we asked her about this. And so she said, well, Mom, I got to do all kinds of fun things that I love doing. I got to go hiking. I got to go swimming. We got to roast marshmallows. Right? We went whitewater rafting. She said, we even got to shoot bow and arrows. And you know how much I like to shoot stuff. And I had been wanting to try shooting bows and arrows. And it's like, well, Miriam, I mean, it sounds like you got to do all these fun things. Why was it not fun? And she said that... Everything that they were doing fun, they had to stop and they had to think about the expectations of it. They were actually instructed, I'll go back to the bow and arrow one, they were actually instructed before they went to shoot bows and arrows to think about their arrow shooting through the sky with all the hopes and dreams that God had for them. And my kid, having pretty good comedic timing, paused for a minute. She said, my arrow didn't go very far. <laughs> right? Thanks for laughing, Jared, right? My arrow didn't go very far. And I thought about that story as I was thinking about why, why does, you know, why does our, even our fun end up getting ruined? And it gets ruined by all the expectations we put around it. 
And as a doctor, I mean, I tell people they gotta do stuff, right? They gotta do things. But we have to really be careful about not putting all of those expectations around it. Otherwise, we end up shaming people and we create more stress. So with that in mind, I'm gonna back up a little bit. The first thing I'm gonna tell you, right? Okay, I'm gonna go back to that biopsychosocial model stuff. Remember, I promised you that that's the kind of doctor that I am. And I promised you not a ton of science, but I think it's important to have a little bit of science behind this. So most people know that stress is bad for us, right? Bad. So why is stress so bad, right? And at its fundamental level, stress damages our DNA. Most of us have kind of heard about DNA, right? And everybody's kind of seen that little helix. That's, a, that's as far as I'm going to go. And on the outside of DNA right, are these little things called telomeres. Right? And you don't have to remember that now. Just know that there are bumpers on the outside of all DNA. And those bumpers protect the DNA from damage. What happens with stress, stress damages the bumpers, exposing the DNA. So it exposes it to oxidative stress. Right? That's like rusting. Right? And we'll talk about what that translates to. It exposes it to metabolic stress. And it impairs the normal repair mechanisms, right? So our DNA can actually fix itself, right? But when we damage these telomeres on the outside, it can't do that. And most of us have kind of heard that oxidative before. I think most people probably have an idea about me me you know, metabolic stress. So again, remember, at the final moment, right, stress damages our DNA. So when we think about a lot of cultural ideas or even what we're told to do to fix it, you know, I'm gonna use the classic one, everybody gets told to lose weight. Your DNA doesn't care how much you weigh, right? It might care what kinds of exercise you do and what sorts of relaxation things you do and what kinds of foods you eat, but it actually doesn't care how much you weigh. So as we go back to it and we come back to this, what are we really talking about? Well, we're talking about creating health-promoting behaviors that help us let our DNA do its job. I'm gonna erase this now because I need to write some other stuff too. So, stress is bad. We're gonna keep that one up there because that's kind of our theme. It'll keep me focused. So, <clears throat> back to this idea about forcing things with expectations. And Jerry mentioned that we're friends and I was gonna talk a little bit about, about Jerry. So, we have a lot of words in our culture that I think have been ruined, right? We talk about balance. And we talk about the journey. I was really trying to find a word that hasn't been totally ruined. And one of Jerry's favorite sayings is the unforced rhythm of the divine. And that word really came to me, which is unforced. So DNA, right? Okay, and our bodies, and I'm going to tie this back in. I'm going to make sure that I say this so it really makes sense. In the end, Mind, body, spirit, medicine is about creating a set of circumstances that allow our bodies to do the job they were meant to do, heal themselves, create metabolic and environmental changes inside that allow our body to do the job it's meant to do in an unforced way. So as we come back to talking about the changes that people need to make, right, it's not about I'm not going to give you 10 things that you have to do to fix yourself, but we're going to talk more about the things that we can do to create that environment for our bodies to heal themselves. And that's the big difference between my body spirit medicine versus traditional Western medicine. I'm going to erase this now. And I'm going to write another little diagram that I like to write in my office. So, Breaking out of shame cycles, and I, I think I promised the title of this was going to be Shameless, Ditching Self-Help for Self-Care. So let's go back to the shame cycle. Most of us, especially if you go to the doctor, you get told all the things you got to do to fix yourself. And we want to. So we start out with an I suck message. Right? This is a shame message. It somehow says that I'm not doing it well enough, whatever that is. 
in your own. We start out with this message, and culture reinforces this message. And we are never enough. So we write a list of things. Right? Come on, let's go ahead and put that one back on there. Right? So, lot, right? We're going to weight loss. Just about everybody goes to the doctor and gets told that. All right? We're going to eat better. Right? And we're going to sleep more. And we're going to, what else are we going to do? We're going to quit smoking. Oh, come on. See, that's typical, right? Right? Quit tobacco, maybe drink less. Anybody else can anything, anything else, I'll let you think about that at home. But right, you're going to get this laundry list of things. Well, most of the time when you get handed a list like that, again, I, I, I know I promised you I wasn't going to give you a to-do list, so this is temporary. Right? This itself becomes a form of chronic stress. And what did we say about stress? Right? Stress actually damages our DNA. So unfortunately, even some of the things that we're taught to do to make our health better, right? actually become a source of chronic stress that turns around and damages our DNA. So that's issue number one. And issue number two is inevitably, right, this is an all or none pattern right, that is doomed to fail. And I'm going to go ahead and put fail in quotes because it's not really failure. Right? And then what happens? How many people feel worse about themselves? And they end up feeling worse. And right? so you've increased your stress. You don't feel any better about yourself and you're back at this message. So, the real first change, and it is absolutely critical, the real first change is ditching this entire thing and moving through to a different plan. Um, well, I'm going to talk a little bit more rather than write things. It looks like I took up all my room. Yeah. So, the crazy thing is I actually want you to do some of these as a doctor, but I don't want you to do them from this cycle. Now, remember how we keep talking about that unforced or the part that the body knows how to do on its own? So part of this focus now is I'm going to move on to what I consider to be the second phase of this, right, is we're going to talk about breaking out of this pattern. How do we break out of this pattern? Because I know a lot of us get stuck in it. And we're probably going to come back and forth to it. And so how to break out of this pattern, I'm going to give you a little exercise. A little exercise. And so right now I might have you guys get a piece of paper and a pen. And I'm going to draw some little dots on the board while you guys are going and getting a piece of paper and a pen. And while you're doing that, Lisa, is this kind of, if someone comes to see you, is this, is this how you practice medicine? Practice, I mean, <laughs> would you say about 100%? I mean, well, maybe not every single office visit, but this is the basis of my medical practice. Because it's so practice. core. Yeah, exactly. It, it's core. So, I mean, of course we want to encourage behavioral change. And, and, and again, mind-body-spirit medicine ultimately is health promoting. Mm -hmm. So that list of things that we talked about, right? Eating better, exercising. And, and I'm gonna go on and talk about a couple other things later too, but like we want people to do these things. We want people to quit smoking. We want to encourage health right. promoting behaviors. <laughs> but we do them to create an environment for the body to heal itself. So that we're actually awakening the body's natural processes to do this. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. All right. So everybody got their little piece of paper? So here, the task here is to get these dots in a single line without leaving the page. And I will give you a solution. I'm going to let you look at it for a minute. All right. In fact, while I'm, giving, while I'm letting you look at it for a minute, I'm going to write a couple other things up here.
All right, you guys have a chance to look at that? So I don't know what you guys figured out, but I'm gonna go ahead and um, talk about the answer. So most people, when they look at this, they try to make a box. And, and you can't make a traditional box with this and connect all the dots with a single line. Did you get a chance to look at it? Did you think about it? And Jerry's a pretty out of the box person, remember? Yeah, what, what, I'm, what, I'm way too far out of the box. <laughs> what did Jerry, I don't know what Jerry saw, but I'm, I'm gonna draw it, okay? I was watching you write. You're watching me write, okay. So anyhow, yeah, so most people try to make a box. And if you if you figured this out, all right, I am, I'm really pleased. And, um, and again, you can stare at it for a little while, most people try, and then, you know, you can't, because you can't leave the page. And so, in order to solve this in the way it's been asked, you have to start out of the box. Okay? And in the end, we don't make a square. Now, this is, this is a silly little game, right? But it really illustrates the point that our measuring mind, our little culturally conditioned minds, want, oops, I didn't do that, typical Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> I, feel, I feel so much better. <laughs> right? But our measuring minds, we want to put everything in the box. Right? And so, so for this ex particular exercise, you have to start outside and, and go around the box. So I also like this one because it kind of fit in my little arrow story. So it reminded me of a little arrow. Right? And so, again, we're going to be talking about what are things that get outside the box. And I'm gonna remind you back to the DNA, okay? Remind you back to the DNA. So what are things that, that awaken us to be able to use our body's natural resources? So most of us are pretty understanding about this idea that we have this sympathetic nervous system, right? That's our fight or flight. Most people have experienced that unconscious, fight or flight response, you know you're not in control of it. But you actually have a relaxation response that you're not in control of either. And that's the parasympathetic nervous system. So a lot of times when we're talking about creating opportunities to use your body's own natural resources, what we're really trying to do is teach people to create um, Discipline is a discipline, but to find the things that help trigger their relaxation response. I'm gonna write that one up there too, all right? So it's a relaxation response. This is a physiologic response. You cannot make it happen. Once you can create the environment for it to occur, right, it happens all on its own. And again, it's just like our stress response. You really can't make it happen, but you can create the environment to let it happen. So what are some of the things that create the environment for a relaxation response to occur? Well, some are just things that we, we can set up for ourselves. You can also deliberately do it. So what are some of the things that we can do? Well, fun, joyful movement, right? So food changes our metabolic state, setting the stage. I mean, I kind of put exercise on there. I wanted to put it separately, because again, most of the time when we start talking about exercise, people start creating these ideas that it's like, well, I have to go to the gym, I have to be on the elliptical for 30 minutes, and then I have to weight train, and all those things are good for you, except that's not what I mean right now. So, joyful movement. Um, so, Foods definitely set up the metabolic state. So instead of being focused on one specific diet, form of chronic stress, right? What we want to look at is the certain types of things that create that environment. Petting animals actually sets up the relaxation response. Seeking social support can set you up for the relaxation response. Sitting by the river, I mean, the list can go on. I mean, it might be knitting. I couldn't do it. I couldn't think of every single thing and write on a list and be exhaustive. But so creating this environment. And then you can do deliberate exercises. This falls under the category of mindfulness. Right? Most of us have heard that term. Mindfulness is a part of mind, body, spirit, medicine. I'm distracted. So I'm going to refocus, which is all about mindfulness. So 
most people have heard about meditation, and I do kind of want to do um, a brief intervention here on talking about uh, mindfulness disciplines, which include meditation, visualization. Um, it can be it can be moving. It can be guided. It can be sitting on a pillow. There is not one specific right way to do this. But there are a lot of myths about mindfulness and meditation. And I want to focus on this idea that we're not learning how to stop our thoughts and we're not learning how to relax because those are forced. What we're doing is training ourselves to focus. This is really different. This is a really different idea. Again, we're not trying to stop thoughts. That's impossible. And as we go back and talk about this relaxation response, the goal of mindfulness exercises is to, is to help us trigger a relaxation response. It is measurable. And I promised you a little bit of science. Kind of back up here a little bit, and we'll go back to this unforced idea. So, beginning meditation is really awkward, and I wanted to go ahead and do a brief intervention about what it might be like to do beginning meditation. Remember, I told you it was measurable. So, one of the ways that we, in training people to meditate, that we can use is something called bio dots, and it's basically a mood ring. I don't imagine you guys have one of these sitting at your house right now. You can buy bio dots on Amazon if you actually wanted to try it out. Or you could get a mood ring. It's the same idea. Although traditionally, if you're going to get the bio dot, you're going to put the bio dot right there, kind of in that little spot of your thumb right there. But it's the same idea. It changes color based on the temperature of your skin. And it's actually a way we can measure in practice by that biofeedback and whether or not you're triggering the relaxation response. So when I go back to this idea that it's less important to me how people get this. If they need the support of a guided meditation, there's a million apps out there. If they need to be sitting by a river, if they need to be petting their cat, all of this is okay. There is not one right way. The really, really, really most important part of this is setting aside the time to do this. 10 minutes is okay, 20 minutes is best, and that's neuroscience. 10 minutes is okay, 20 minutes is best, but if 10 minutes is where you start, 10 minutes is where you start. And you're going to practice keeping your focus in the moment. Now we use breath traditionally, because you cannot breathe in the past, you cannot breathe in the future. So most people talk about using breath as their focus. It does not have to be breath. You could learn how to meditate on how your socks feel on your toes. As long as the focus that you keep coming back to, and I'm gonna say that, keep coming back to is the moment. So let's go ahead and use breath, because most people use breath. And whether you have a mood ring or not, right, it doesn't matter. But you could get one if you wanna see how it works. So, beginning meditation, what does it look like? Well, most people are like, okay, I'm gonna do this. Right. And we start, we start with three deep breaths. I don't even have to be closed. Oh man, my back hurts. Oh, oh man. Wait, how long have I been doing this already? Oh, wait, 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 wait. Okay, wait, I'm supposed to be doing this. I'm supposed to be doing this. All right, I'm gonna come back to it. Oh man, I have a leg cramp. Oh, no. All right, this is normal. Okay? The goal of learning how to meditate, this is not a failure. The goal of learning how to meditate is to notice and choose to come back. What you are really doing, I know I'm going to repeat it three times, is you're training to notice and refocus. Notice 
and refocus. You're going to lose your train of thought. You're going to be distracted by the door opening. Anything. You'll be distracted by your own body, sending you signals and your own thoughts and your laundry list. And you're going to have shame messages. You're going to have all of that. And all of that's normal because the real practice is the notice. Oh, I noticed it. And refocus. Every single time you do that, that's a success. Notice, refocus. And as you continue to practice, this is the beauty of neuroscience, you lay down those pathways, which is why it's important to actually do it all the time. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever seen that great Disney movie, Inside Out. Um, in <laughs> Inside Out actually is a really quite a cute story. Um, but the neuroscience behind it is quite good. And I'm going to, again, do a little bit, just a tiny little bit, tiny little bit, that every time you practice something, right, neurons that fire together, wire together. It's a cute little phrase. Neurons that fire together are wired together. So we can create new patterns. The more you practice it, the more you can create those new patterns. So what you are really doing here is you're training a focus pattern that says, I'm over here somewhere, and I'm going to notice this and refocus. When you stop doing it, your brain starts to prune them, just like your garden. This is also a fantastic thing, though. So when you're trying to develop new things, you have to practice it consistently. Neurons that fire together, wire together. So you're going to practice new behaviors that trigger the relaxation response. And this builds on itself. The other thing that you do as you end those processes is your brain goes in and prunes them. That is good news. We can't really unlearn old behaviors, but we can reduce the way that those neurons are wired together. And most of us have had at least some of this experience where we go on autopilot all the time. Well, that's what you're doing. You're creating new autopilot behaviors. So I want to touch once more on this physiologic relaxation response and the unforced idea of it. And I want people to imagine a time where they've been the most relaxed and the most present. And to think about how their ideas about um, I'm going to hold off on that one for a second. Um, how clear messages about what they really need for themselves can be when they're in that relaxed state. Because when we're in that crazy, overthinking state, self-doubt state, this list can be really overwhelming. And if you're feeling that overwhelming, you're not in the relaxation state. You're in the shame state. And so sometimes, the first thing to do before you decide, well, what self-care is the most important to me? is to begin with creating something that puts you in that relaxation state. Again, you're still going to have to figure out how to discipline a little bit of time for yourself, how to create that space in your life. But inevitably, you're going to see when to make that work much better when you begin to find those answers from the relaxation state rather than the overthinking expectations shame state. So I want to leave you with a couple other ideas just to really reemphasize some of this science. Okay? We want you to exercise. I mean, let's, that's it. Okay? Plus exercise creates, um, exercise makes it easier to meditate into a relaxation state. I mean, we just know it does, all right? So, Exercise is kind of one of those big ones. Again, how do I make time to do all the exercise that I need to do? And here's the amazing beauty of it from the neuroscience perspective. You actually don't have to. In fact, stressing yourself out to go do something you hate is actually such a form of chronic stress that neuroscience shows that it causes weight gain. So don't do it. If it's that big of a hurdle, you're actually better off not doing it. You're better off sitting for 10 minutes and practicing your focus with a mood ring. Now, 
we still want you to move. So what are the keys? Well, I'm gonna go back to my kid's story, right? Now my kid likes to move her body joyfully. She does, she's a little jock. But still, even doing all of her fun activities, they were ruined by expectations. And so the neuroscience bears out that if we are not having fun and joyful movement, it's actually bad for our health. I'm gonna say that again. Exercise is bad for our health if we're not doing it joyfully for fun. Same again, dieting. And these really evil neuroscientists, they did this study 